Welcome back to another Nano video. Today we're going to be looking at how to calculate memory bandwidth and memory clock speed. So I've made a previous video on this and I ended up thinking maybe it's time that I make a new video and update sort of the tutorial that I made in the past. Uh, there's several reasons for this. The first, which is that there's been a whole lot more sort of happening in this area in terms of new technologies coming out. So we've had four new types of memory at least. For example, GDDR6, GDDR6X, HBM2E, etc. So I think because of that, it's a good time to make an updated tutorial. On top of that, there's barely any decent tutorials on YouTube in general on this topic. Not a lot of people talk about it. Uh, I'm not going to really talk uh, in a very sort of complex way and really explain every little bit of information about different types of memory. I'm just going to talk about how you calculate these values. So if you're looking for that sort of information, you might need to look at some white papers or something directly from JDEC or something like that. But this is just so you can understand sort of the basics of how to calculate these values. And I think because of what's happening in the world, I thought, why not? I've got time to do it. So let's get started. So some basic concepts to understand first, if you understand the difference between bits and bytes already, you can skip ahead in the video because I'm just going to get this basic information out there so that people can understand that so they can understand the rest of the video. If you're already sort of way ahead on that, that's fine. You can just skip a little bit ahead. I'm gonna really talk about this for maybe a minute, minute and a half, something like that. So there's two bits of information. There's bits and then there's bytes. And these are two different things. So bits are the lowest form of data in computing and they're stored as binary. And that means that they're either stored as a zero or a one. So as you can see here in this diagram, a bit, I've got an arrow pointing to it and every number here, one, zero, one, etc., is a bit of information. And you need eight of those to make a byte in total. So bits are denoted in computing with a lowercase b. So I give the example here, which is capital G, then lowercase b, p, s. And that means gigabits per second. So if you see anything with a lowercase b, it means bits. And if you see anything with an uppercase b, so for example, capital G, capital B, slash S, uh, that's gigabytes per second. So you need to understand the difference between those. If you understand this, then you'll understand the rest of the video. So you need at least eight of these bits to make one byte. And it's gonna be very important for the rest of this video that you understand that. So make sure you understand this and we're gonna move on now. So there's also different data rates of memory. So for example, with random access memory, we use double data rate. It's the most common type of data rate for memory. And if you have something like DDR3 or DDR4 RAM in your computer, that's using double data rate. So what exactly is data rate? Well, essentially what a data rate is, is it's, it signifies how much data is being sent per clock cycle. So there's one signal or two signals or four signals or eight signals, etc. And we denote this by calling it different types of data rates. So for example, here we have SDR, which means single data rate, DDR, which means double data rate, and QDR, which means quad data rate. DDR sends two signals per clock cycle. SDR sends one signal per clock cycle and QDR sends four signals per clock cycle. And each signal is denoted here by a red dot. Now this green dotted line signifies where a clock cycle ends and begins. So you can see that where this green dotted line starts, that's where a clock cycle starts at. And the next one tells you where that previous clock cycle ended and the next one starts. So DDR in this case would be sending two red dots, which is what we can see here per clock cycle. And the next one, it sends another two. And then the next one, it'll send another two and so on. SDR will send one. As you can see, there's only one dot here. And QDR will send four. So there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. And then the next one, there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. 
and then the next one and so forth. Now also there's a rise and a fall in each clock cycle and that's denoted by this pink line here or purple, it depends on you know what you want to call it, but essentially there's a rise and a fall. Now you have to understand that there's always a rise and a fall and because of that you need to take that into account when we're doing our calculations a little bit later on. So you have to understand this, the signal and then there's the clock cycle and then there's also the rise and the fall within each clock cycle. These are all integrated in the calculation later on. So the first type of memory that we're going to be looking at, it's a little bit older now, but it's GDDR5. It's a very common sort of one in lower end products. So something like a GTX 1660 or a GTX 1650. And so we use it in these lower end products. So something like the GTX 1660, which was released in March of 2019, has the memory clock of 2001 megahertz and an effective memory clock of eight gigabit per second and a memory bus width of 192 bits. So how do you calculate effective memory clock for something like GDDR5, which is double data rate? Well, you take the memory clock and you times it by two and then you times it by two again and that gives you the effective memory clock. So for example, Let's use the GTX 1660. You take this 2001 megahertz, which is the memory clock, and then you times it by two for the rise and the fall in each uh, clock cycle. And then you times it by two because it's double data rate. So it's sending two signals per clock cycle. And that gives you 8,004 bits, which is approximately eight gigabit per second. So that's how you calculate the effective memory clock. Uh, I'm gonna use the same sort of structure when I'm talking about the different types of memory a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how you do just the effective memory clock. Now we're gonna use the effective memory clock to then calculate the memory bandwidth. So to calculate the memory bandwidth, you take the effective memory clock, then you times it by the memory bus width, and then you divide it by eight, because there's eight bits in every byte and we're trying to get bytes. So for example, with the GTX 1660, if we take the effective memory clock, which was 8,004 bits or 8,004 megahertz, whatever you want to call it, and then you times it by 192 because that is the memory bus width, which is 192 bits or 192 bit. And then you divide it by eight because there's eight bits in every byte. And that gives you 192,096 bytes, which is approximately 192 gigabyte per second. So that tells you the effective, um, or the actual memory bandwidth. Now we're going to move on to GDDR5X and GDDR6X. So these two memory technologies are actually quad data rate and they're pretty widely used. Uh, the GDDR5X was on the GTX 1080 as well as the 1080 Ti and the GDDR6 memory is on RDNA2 cards. So something like the 6800 XT or it's on the RTX 2080 Super or the RTX 3060 Ti, etc. All of these types of memories are currently being used in most cards, whether it's from AMD or NVIDIA. So we're gonna use the RTX 2080 Super, for example, it has a memory clock of 1937 megahertz and an effective memory clock of 15 and a half gigabit per second, and then a memory bus width of 256 bit. So again, to calculate the effective memory clock, we take the memory clock, so 1937 megahertz, and we times it by two for the rise and for the fall, but this time we're timesing it by four because it's quad data rate. So we've got four signals per clock cycle. So when we use it on something like the RTX 2080 Super, we're doing 1,937 megahertz times two times four, and that gives us 15,496 bits, which is approximately, when you round it up, 15 and a half gigabit per second. So that's pretty simple to understand, I think, as long as you understand that this two changes to a four because it's quad data rate instead of dual data rate, you'll be fine. Now to calculate the memory bandwidth, it's the exact same calculation. You just take the effective memory clock, you times it by the memory bus width, and then you divide it by eight. And that's true for 
pretty much every example that I'm going to talk about when it comes to memory bandwidth. So in this case, it's 15,496 bits times 256 bit, and then you divide it by eight and you get 495,872 bytes, which is approximately 495 gigabytes per second. GDDR6X is also quad data rate, but it uses a different type of signaling. So how I, what I was talking about, for example here, four signals per clock cycle, GDDR6X uses a different type of signaling. So it doesn't just send four bits of information or four signals in one clock cycle, it uses actually a four by four uh, type of signaling. But we can actually simplify this a little bit easier. So on the RTX 3080, which was released in September of 2020, we have an effective or a memory clock of 1188 megahertz and an effective memory clock of 19 gigabit per second and a memory bus width of 320 bit. So when it comes to PAM4 signaling, we also have that on top of the QDR. So we have the quad data rate. So we have memory clock times the rise and the fall, and then we times it because we've got the quad data rate by four, and then we times that by two for PAM4 signaling. And that gives us an effective memory clock. So if we take the 11,000 or 1,188 megahertz, we times it by two for the rise and the four, times it by four for the quad data rate, and then times it by two for the PAM4 signaling, we get 19,008 bits, which is approximately 19 gigabit per second. Then again, we just calculate the memory bandwidth by taking the effective memory clock, so that 19,000 bits, we times it by 320 bit, and then we divide it by eight and we get 760 gigabytes per second. So, I hope you understood that. There's a different type of signaling. I would explain PAM4 signaling, but I think you're probably better to look it up from someone who understands it a little bit better. I just understand how the calculation works and that it's a little bit different to the previous sorts of signaling types that we used. Next up is HBM, HBM2, HBM2E. They're all sort of the same. I'm not actually sure what type of data rate it uses. It could just be single data rate. I'm not too sure because you don't have to times by two again. So I don't know, but it doesn't really matter. It works all the same when you're calculating it. So yeah, but basically HBM2 is in Vega cards mostly. It's also used in a few select NVIDIA professional products, but it's not really that widely used because it's very expensive. Um, but when you can find it in a card, it's great because it has so much memory bandwidth and uh, you can have really high capacity. But anyway, let's talk about how to actually calculate it. So you got the Radeon 7 here, for example. I think this is probably the latest card to really use HBM2 or HBM2E. But in this case, it's using HBM2. So you got the Radeon 7, which has an, a memory clock of 1000 megahertz and an effective memory clock of two gigabit per second. The difference here is that it has a memory bus width of 4096 bit. So it's got a really wide memory bus, but much slower or much lower clocked RAM, but it still ends up being a lot faster in terms of memory bandwidth, as you're gonna discover. So when you're doing uh, any sort of SDR or even just with HBM2, because I'm not sure if it's SDR. Uh, you just take the memory clock and you times it by two for the rise and the fall, and that gives you the effective memory clock. So in this example, we have a thousand megahertz, you times it by two, you get 2000 bits, which is two gigabit per second. And then you take that effective memory clock, you times it by the memory bus width, and then you divide it by eight. So we take the 2000 bits, we times it by 4096, and then we divide it by eight and we get 1,024 gigabytes per second, which is really, really quick and a lot of memory bandwidth in comparison to say something like GDDR6X, which has to have much faster clocked RAM on a smaller bus to get anywhere close to HBM2. So yeah, if you guys have any questions, 
uh, leave them in the comment section below. I'll be more than happy to answer some of them. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you have, you know, liked this video or want to see more tutorials like this. And uh, yeah, I'll be sure to make an updated tutorial for anything that you guys might want if you type it in the comment section below. And yeah, so I'll see you in the next video.